Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you so much for the opportunity that we once again have to gather. The opportunity to uh, well, just recognize you as, as Lord and Savior and to worship you, Father, for the sacrifice that you made for us. Father, I just pray that through today you'll be honored and glorified because we are here. We pray this in your Son's name. Amen.
<laughs> Several years ago, I was sitting in a Sunday school class, and a discussion came up about communion. And the teacher of the class said, I would like each one of you to think about this question. What do you think about when you take communion? Well, I'm, like most people, you know, we know it's the shed blood of Christ, that his body represents, the uh, cracker represents the, his body, Jews represents his blood. But that, it goes beyond that. If we take the Bible, the whole Bible focuses on Jesus Christ, from Genesis to Revelation, the entire Bible. If you look, you'll find Jesus in every book of the Bible. It's about him, guys. It's not about us. It's about him. Who he is, what he was prophesied, what he was to come, what he was going to do, what was going to happen to him, what he was here, and he was going to. Do. And then was book was written about him after he was resurrected. Okay, I want to give you just a couple of things that I think about pretty often when I take communion. In the Old Testament, we know about the book of Exodus, when God sent Moses to King Pharaoh in Egypt to ask him to free the Israelites from slavery. They were in bondage to the, to the Egyptians. Pharaoh's heart was hardened. He said, no. So what? God said, okay. He sent plagues upon Egypt, trying to get them to say, to release the Israelite people. He said, no. No, not going to do it. He's not going to do it. So the final plague was this. He's going to send the plague, the angel of death to kill the firstborn of every family, the first male of each family, including the animals. And it was very significant, the firstborn male of each family in that time. But he told Moses to tell the people, the Israelites, to take a lamb without blemish, a perfect lamb. And to slaughter this lamb, take the blood from this lamb, put it on the side post and over the, post and over the door. That way, when the angel of death comes through, he would pass over their house. Not one person would be harmed. That's where we got the word Passover. And the Jewish people still celebrate it right today. So it was about the lamb, the sacrifice. Now with that in mind, we go into the New Testament, the book of John, chapter 1, verse 29. John the Baptist, picture this in your mind, John the Baptist down the river Jordan. He's baptized for the repentance of sin. He sees Jesus coming. Sort of down like a little bank, you know, down the floor, down the river. And he sees him. He knows Jesus. He knows who he is. He says, look, the Son of God, the sacrificial Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus was baptized. Heavens opened up when he came up out of the water. The heavens open, God says, Behold my son in whom I am well pleased. This is about what Jesus did for us. He sacrificed himself on the cross by shedding his blood as payment for our sins. Without him doing that, going to the cross and paying the penalty of Mark chapter 10, verse 45, Jesus says, I I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as ransom for many. Just we we'll put this together. He ransomed us. He paid the ransom to get us out of slavery to sin with his precious, sinless blood. Please think about this.
serving us by dying on the cross for us and for our sins, take them away so that we can serve you in this life and in the future. And in your name we pray. Amen.
prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we're here we gathered here today to sing praises and listen to your word. This week we have folded our labors. And we give a portion back to you with an open and graceful heart, a cheerful heart. We ask you to bless us all, King Lord, and bless, bless our ministries. We ask this in Jesus' name.
I'm going to talk today, I don't know if you noticed the sign off around or not. Uh, all for one and one for all. No excuses. Um, what's an excuse? What we think is a reason not to do something. You know, um, my, my brother-in-law says all the time, I have a John Deere tractor. Well, what does that have to do with it? It's an excuse. You know, any excuse is good, right? Um, what we want to look at today is this. What excuse do you have not being 100%? All for one and one for all. What does that mean? We are all here for the one. And the one was here for us, wasn't it? No excuses. Uh, if you are in Sunday school with us, we're, we finished up the book out of fan today. And the last chapter, the last segment, I think, the last three chapters, were uh, entitled... Whenever, wherever, whatever. And what they were trying to teach us about is that whenever God calls, wherever He wants you to go, whatever He wants you to do, go. I mean, we look up in, uh, in Matthew, and we can read the stories there, and we can see in Matthew chapter 4 where Jesus was calling the disciples. And he goes up on the sea and he sees Peter John, they're, they're fishing. And he says, hey, come and follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. And what excuse did they give? None. None. What did they do? <laughs> Got out of their boat and followed. Man, can you imagine? Be at work, wherever you work, wherever your job is, put yourself in that position. You know, standing before a student's teaching, um, um, working behind the desk, getting the, the payroll and stuff ready. Um, wherever it is you work, put yourself there, you're hard at work. A strange man walks up and says, Hey, come and follow me, I'm making fishers of men. What do you say? How many of you say, Okay, drop your pen, drop whatever you're doing, and, and start following? What's the excuse? Well, in the Bible, Jesus said, come and follow me. And, and one man said, oh, well, let me go bury my father. The story didn't tell you that his father's dead or not. You know, let me go bury my father. Like whenever he dies and I bury him, I'll, I'll come follow you. Sometimes when, when God does do something, we, we ask the question, now? Today? We, we, come, up, we come up with all kinds of things. I want to I want to look at a story today. A story in the Bible that um, depicts kind of what we're talking about, and it has a great meaning to it. It's found in Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. I mean, we, we'd go all kinds of stories. We'd go to Moses when Moses was told to go deliver to people. Moses, well, I can't speak. I'll give you air. Well, I'm not a big... I do. Did you get the idea with Moses, no matter what, what, what he came up with, God had an answer? Why? God had something He wanted done. He wanted Moses to do it, and there was nothing Moses could do to stop him from making it. Um, we could look at Jonah. Jonah was told to do something. Didn't really want to do it. What it cost him? <laughs> Someone said in Sunday school last week, it was real funny, a three-day cruise. <laughs> kind of like today's cruises. You know, the ships are sick and everyone's sick. And people are breaking down. Kind of along that line. Not no good bathroom facilities. No real good food to eat. Combinations kind of stunk, if what I mean. Uh, what did Jonah do after his three-day cruise? Went to Nineveh. 
Oh, he went. Grumbling and complaining about it, but he went. Because he knew after his three-day cruise that God wants me. Now, now gang, I, I want you to look at the story in chapter 14. We're going to start at verse 15. And read it. It says, Oh, I think it's 14. Is it chapter 14, 15? Tell me it is. Read about a feast? Yes. Oh, okay, that's right. I thought I said it wrong. Uh, start with verse, uh, let's go to verse 7. When, when he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this man your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But you, when you arrive, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to the better place. Then you'll be honored in the presence of all your fellow guests. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Then Jesus said, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers and relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the man who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. And here's where he gets into the story. Then Jesus replied, A certain man was, prepared, was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said, I have just bought a field. I must go see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to the master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, Go out into the road, the country lanes, and make them come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, no one, of, not one of those men who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. So what is he saying? That last story, I mean, he's telling different stories about big feasts and banquets, and he says, only invite these type of people because then you can't be repaid. The man invited his friends, neighbors, and guests, and they what? They made excuses. They made excuses not to come to the feast. One, I just got married. Uh, well, I just bought five oxen. Uh, I got a John Deere tractor. <laughs> That's what they said. And, and, and they go through the whole thing, and, and then he says, well, go out and get the lame, and there's still room, and he brought in more and more. What's the story talking about, really? How many of you have been invited to a great feast? Where is that feast? Heaven. So there's a feast in heaven, you've been invited. How many of you have excuses? Well, five honest people. How many of us have excuses? We, we all do, don't we? How many of us come to the Master and do what need, what's needed to be done to be at the feast? See, the first ones invited to the feast was who? Jews. And the Jews what? No thanks. No thanks. Kind of made excuses. Kind of, well, we're, we're waiting for the real Jesus to come. We're waiting on this. They had excuses. You know? Well, this isn't the normal way we do things. So they didn't come to the feast. So Jesus says what? Go to the Gentiles. 
Go to the lame, the lost, the blind, the, the, the feeble. Go to us and offer the feast. And when a feast is offered, there's two responses. Yes and no. Yes, I'll attend the feast. Saying yes means what? To accept the gift of salvation. To 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 walk an aisle to to at some point come to a point where you believe that Jesus is the Christ Son we got and you give your life to him. You've accepted the invitation for the feast at the end. What does it say at the end when the resurrection of the righteous? How many of you are righteous? We are. We are through Christ. We're not on our own, but through Christ we're righteous. Through the acceptance of that feast invitation, I'm righteous. And on that day when the resurrection of the righteous come, the feast. And can you imagine the feast? You know, table as long as you can see. Because we're all going to be there. Not. Nah. you understand that? I know this as I stand here today, as I am in, as I am right here right now, I'm at the feast. But some days I have excuses. Oh, I, I can't today, I've got kids to raise. I can't today, I, I gotta work. I, I can't today, my pool is needing vacuum. I can't today, my truck broke down. I, we find reasons and excuses somewhere in there, don't we? That we can't do something that day that God asks us to do. The Master said, here, and we said, no thanks. Thank God for forgiveness. Gang, gang I'm, just a, I'm as guilty as you. When I preach a sermon, I am preaching right at me. There are days that I make excuses not to have to go do certain things I should be doing. Things I know I do. <coughs> and thank God that Christ's blood covers me. Not that I should sin on purpose. Not that I should just put off things because it covers But, thank God when, when I fall, I'm covered. When He said, goodness, let me show Don't forget you have to ask for it. <coughs> okay, I came up with an excuse. I didn't show up at the feast, but ask the master for forgiveness. I'm sorry. Here's what I did. Can you forgive me for that? I'll be there for you next time. And in this story, he's talking directly to us. And all those people who made excuses, what does he say? They don't get anything. When the resurrection of the righteous come, they lose. So he's trying to make a point here, Dave. We have got to accept the invitation. What's the invitation? God says, do you know my son? Jesus. Scripture tells us there's no other way to the Father but through the Son. We have to accept that Son. We have to accept that invitation of Him in order to have the feast with God. If we don't, we don't get it. We can sit here and say, I'm at the feast. No. And what's sad is this. There's a lot of people sitting in churches today that aren't going to get it. <laughs> See, there, it's... it's more than this. For some people, this is all God gets. This hour. In 20 minutes. Just tell me you're going to go over today. So you... <laughs> God gets an hour and 20 minutes. From, from 10 to 11, 15, 11, <coughs> that's what He gets. And, and I can tell you that's what He gets. You want to know how I know that's what he gets? Because about 11.15, three of you are going to look at your watch. 
<laughs> it is. There's three of you. I could point you out if I wanted to. <laughs> because I see it. I see it all the time. At 11.15, someone's going to wake up. <laughs> it's, like, it's like the alarm went off in their head. Yep. Certain things happen at 11.15. I just wonder if it happens that way during the week. When you're working on something at 11.15, you go, oh, <laughs> do you that at work? <laughs> There are things that take place that, that, that you notice when you're standing up here in front of you. Um, yeah. and there, there's some weeks I want to say, your hair looks fine. Stop. <laughs> you know, when you're... Sorry. <laughs> I, really, I really like it when they're doing this. mirror, what are you putting down? <laughs> but there are things you see. It, it, sorry, I, I'm, telling, I'm telling you a second. You're laughing. Stand up here and watch it. There's sometimes that I'm preaching that I have to come over and go, where in the world was I? You know what they're doing? You know, you know what they're doing to me? Distract. Excuses. Do you know what this is? An excuse. I've been here long enough. Um, what are we doing? Yeah. It used to be in the old days you could say because everybody went home to eat after church instead of out to eat. You used to say that the roast was burned. You could tell the women are going, <laughs> we're going to have baptisms today? Oh my. We're going to all bring lunch. You know? Those things happen, but, but we make excuses on those things. I mean, and when you're here, are you here? When we're singing the songs of worship, are you worshiping? Or do you have an excuse why you did it? When they're praying, do you pray? I mean, how many of you listen to the person pray? How many of you say your own prayer when they're praying? No. Communion time? Yes. Nothing against whoever prayed for communion. I pray my own prayer. I know it's prayer time you're praying, but I pray my own prayer because I want to make sure that I'm ready for this. That I'm clear, set for this. Now, I've already done that prior too, but I want to just make sure that last... Maybe I uh, knock someone down coming out of Sunday school. I'm going to get forgiveness for that. You know, something, something along the line. To make sure I'm, I want to be ready. I want to make sure that I'm not doing this wrong. When I eat and drink, I want, it, I, want it, I want it to be what it is and what it's meant to be, and I want it to be right. And worshiping gets me set for that. You know, I, I tell the worship band all the time, this isn't a performance. You know, we could very easily turn to church this way and have them up front all the time while we sing, and there's a reason we have them at the side. You know what it is? Eddie, Eddie said it in a second. It's not about them. They are an instrument, and their job is to lead us to the feet of Jesus. So that when it comes time for this, we're there. We're ready. We don't let things distract us of it. If you're not there, man, what's your excuse? There's got to be one. We are, we are the master of excuses, aren't we? I mean, sometimes we could, we're asked to do something. We could very well do it. But we don't. Because I forget, this is a doozy of an excuse. I've been waiting to use it. That's how we act sometimes, isn't it? Here's the part that scares me. Judgment. You know what judgment is? Standing before the great Almighty God. And He says, why didn't you... You know, had Jonah not gone ever, he would ask Jonah, why didn't you, when I told you, I gave you a three-day cruise, I did everything I could do to get you to do, why? See, because sometimes I think we're worse than Jonah. 
I think sometimes God has to do something. We say no, we'll go the other direction, and we never go back. We had a great verse in the Sunday school this morning. Where Jesus says, No man who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service. Ouch. Anyone here except Christ as their Lord and Savior? Anyone look back? What does look back mean? Anybody allowed the old life to creep in? <coughs> you know, I, I walked forward when I was in seventh grade. It was as plain as if I did it yesterday. And I tell you this all the time, man, that day I was like, I mean, I didn't say the words, but I was thinking like Superman, Spider-Man, Aquaman. You could name them all, put them all in one thing. I was that superhero. Come on, sin. Bring it on. Man, you know what? It did. And I tell you all the time, Sunday I was to beat the world. Monday I was back at school and I was the old trace. And I allowed life that quick to creep back in because I, what? I was comfortable where I lived. And now Jesus wanted me to live different, but I was comfortable here. And it took years. I, I, I'm not in any way, way, shape, or form proud of this, but it took years for me to realize that that decision I made when I walked that aisle accepted Him as my Lord and Savior meant something. Maybe you were in that same boat. And I had all kinds of excuses for my friends for things. Well, when someone said, well, what are you, one of those goody two church people around? No, my mom and dad make us do that, but we don't listen. I'm going to be honest with you, man. First six months I was in church, I didn't listen. First six months I we went to church, I was mad every Sunday. They were getting me out of bed to go to church. Why? Because we were bad. <laughs> We were bad and they were trying to make us good. And slowly after a while we start listening to these things and then we start singing in the youth choir and then we start doing these things that, that it slowly infiltrated in and, and we made a decision. And it was a good decision. Did it change me? That day. Tony, it took years for me to understand that, 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 that movement I made down the aisle. It took me years on chat, and I had all excuses of why. But then I realized one day that the excuse doesn't work. God wants what God wants. And God wants it when He wants it. And He wants whoever He says to do it to do it. When He said to do it. Whenever, wherever, whatever. No excuses. Okay, we are all in this together for the one. Because the one did what he did for all of us. He could have made up excuse. Father, if there's any other way, take this cup from me. He came close to it, didn't he? But not my will, thine be done. Father, I, I want to go do this today, but not my will, yours be done. What would you have me to do today? You know, and when I pray at the end of church all the time, I pray that this week God puts something in your path that you can witness to. And I don't pray that lightly. I mean, I really hope that God puts somebody in your path that you can witness to. And what I should ask every Sunday is, did you? When God put that situation there, when He gave you the opportunity, did you do it? If not, what's your excuse? No excuse is any good for God. When you look at what He did and how He did it, when you look at He was tempted with sin the same way we were and He withstood it, what's our excuse? People here were invited to a feast and came up with all kinds of ideas and gang. We're invited to this feast, a huge feast, a feast like you've never seen before. You've never seen the likes of what this feast is going to be like. And the praise and worship that's going to go on at this feast is phenomenal. 
And the question is this today. Will you be at the feast? Without excuses. Will you be one that he can count on to show up when he needs you? Will you be there to fill his house? Because it's going to be full. Hey, do you know Jesus? The invitation to the feast. If you're here today and you don't know him, and today's maybe the day you need to. Maybe today's the day you need to stop out and say, you know what? I need that. I need that relationship with Jesus that I have no doubt in my mind or my soul where I'm going to go when the resurrection of the righteous happens. Has your ticket been punched? <laughs> You're here today and you've given your life to Christ at some point. Maybe you've gotten to the point where excuses have become your own. Reasons why you can't. Well, my health. Well, this. Well, that. I mean, well, my back. You know, I could claim my back in a lot of things. And there's, there's a lot of things I normally do around the house that I haven't been able to do, but I try. You know, standing up here every Sunday, you see me moving today? You know why I'm moving? Because if I stand still, it's going to hurt. But we're here. Why? Because God. You do what God has you to do when He has you to do it. Not any other time. <coughs> and as He puts someone in your path and you did you do it? Has He offered you opportunities to serve Him and you turned them down? There's going to be no excuse good at judgment. There's going to be no way to answer the questions if he asks questions for you. I'm hoping that when I get to judgment, I stand there, and the only thing I hear is, enter in a good, faithful servant. I don't want to stand there and have him say, well, remember when you did, oh, I should have asked for forgiveness for that. You ever think? I mean, okay, we've got to be ready for Him. Ready to serve. Ready to be His. The book we did. we got to be followers, not just fans. Followers do more than this hour and 20 minutes. Ago. Followers are digging in their Word every day. Followers are spending time in prayer, not just for what they want, the needs of this world, and for strength, and for courage to withstand. Followers are there day in, day out, no matter what. It's getting tough in this world. Every day you see new things done where Christians can't speak out, Christians can't do this. And it's going to come to a point that God's going to want you to stand. And if you haven't built your spiritual muscles, it'll be impossible for you to do that. So if you're here this morning and you've made a decision for Christ and you've let things go, this morning, talk to them. Tell them. No more excuses. Today, I'm yours. And every day from here on, I'm yours. What would you have me to do? Where would you have me to go? What would you have me to say? Who do you want me to do it to? That's the only answer. And if you have a decision to make, whether it's the first time for Christ this morning or, or whether it's get back on it, do so as we stand as we sing our song.
<laughs> In the middle of my sermon, I was, I was going to play a song. And uh, there was a section where I was telling you about the watches and the sleepers and all that kind of excuse. And uh, I just kind of glossed over it because I, I didn't want to break where we were. But uh, I want you to see this video because, and I want you to pay attention to the words and picture that. I want you to hear what they're saying because we all do this. I mean, I remember an old man when I was in Portsmouth, Ohio, who uh, said he couldn't come to church anymore because the pews were too hard. <laughs> and, and we paid we paid to pad half the pews. They, they had seat pads back then. And so we told him that, and he came and sat. And he came for a couple weeks, and then he wasn't there anymore. And we said, man, what's the problem? He says, the pews are too soft. <laughs> <laughs> It's excuses. Well, this gospel group put together a song, and it's an old song, and maybe you know what it's not, called Excuses, and, and it's really neat. And I like what they do because they put a lot like, well, the minister's too boring, the minister's too short, the minister's too tall, the minister's too fat. The minister's too... And so you kind of watch and see what this is. It's kind of just neat to close things out. Excuses, excuses, you hear them every day. Now the devil, he'll spy them at the church you stay away. When people come to worship God, the devil always loses. So to keep those folks away from the church, he offers them excuses. Well, the summer is too hot, and the winter is too cold. In the springtime, when the weather's just right, find someplace else to go. Well, it's up to the mountains or down to the beach or to visit some old friend, or just stay home and kind of relax and hope some of the kin folks start dropping in. Well, those church benches, they're too hard, and that song that is way too loud, well, you know how nervous you get. When you're sitting in the great cold. Now the doctor told you you've been watching crap. They'll set you back. But you go to that old ball game because they say it helps you to relax. Well, a headache Sunday morning and a backache Sunday night. But by work time Monday morning, you're feeling quite all right. Well, one of the children has a cold. Pneumonia, do you suppose? Why, the whole family had to stay home. Just blow that cold again. Mm -hmm. Excuses, excuses, you hear them every day. Now the devil will spy them if the church you stay away. When people come to worship God, the devil always loses. So to keep those folks away from the church, he offers them excuses. Well, the preacher, he's too young, or maybe he's too old. His sermons, they're not hard enough, or maybe they're too bold. His sermons are too quiet. Sometimes he gets too loud. He needs to have more dignity, or else he's way too proud. His sermons, they're too long, or maybe they're too short. He needs to preach the word with dignity instead of stomp and snort. Well, that preacher we got must be the world's most stuck up man. While one of the ladies told me the other day, Why, I didn't even shake my hand. Excuses, excuses, <laughs> you hear them every day. Now the devil, he'll spy them in church, you stay away. When people come to worship God, the devil always loses. So to keep those folks away from the church, he offers them excuses. So to keep those folks away from the church, he offers them excuses. <laughs> 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 I mean, I all kinds of excuses. Too hot, too cold, too this. You know, too cold, bring a sweater. Too hot, wear your bikini. <laughs> <laughs> what good was it? However you want to come. Just object is be there. Be there for God. Be there for you. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for today. We thank you so much for our ability to gather. Father, we just thank you for the songs of worship and Father for our ability to commune with you today. Father, we just thank you that your son made the sacrifice he did for us and that we have the ability to do all this. Father, help us to be yours. Help us to do what you say when you say it, not to make excuses, but, Father, to truly be your servants doing your will. Father, this week I pray that you'll guide us and direct us, that you'll keep us safe, and, Father, put someone on our path that we can uh, tell them about you, that we can direct them to you, Father, that they can see you and us. Father, just guide and us now. We pray in your Son's name. Amen.